There's an old saying that the minute you stop learning, you start slipping. That's why I'm going to stop talking and do some listening and learning for a change. Why don't you all listen in with me on this session? I figure a little refresher on electrical fundamentals can't do any harm and will probably do a lot of good. Here's the professor now. Thanks for the introduction, Tech. I'll take it from there. To begin with, it's an established fact that all gases, liquids, and solids contain electrons. The behavior of electricity can be explained by recognizing the existence of these electrons. In order to get from electrons to automotive electricity in the shortest possible time, I'm going to skip the atomic neutrons and protons and stick to the behavior of the electrons. What is an electron? Each electron is a tiny, negatively charged particle of electricity. Nuclear scientists have calculated that six million billion electrons pass one point in a conductor when one ampere flows for one second. I don't expect you to remember that number, but it helps visualize how very small an electron really is. Current flow in a conductor is simply the mass movement of electrons from negative to positive. Maybe I better clear up this business about the direction of current flow before we all get confused. For many years, it was assumed that current flowed from positive to negative. That assumption was wrong, but it didn't make much difference to the electrical engineer until the science of electronics came along. Today, we know for sure that electrons do flow from negative to positive. In present day troubleshooting, don't worry about the direction of electron and current flow. Connect the battery correctly and the direction of current flow will take care of itself. Electron or current flow does most of the work involved in the operation of electrical equipment. That's why we've taken time at the outset to explain the basic nature of electron flow in an electrical circuit. Next, let's talk about conductors. All materials contain electrons, but good conductors have a large number of electrons that can easily be set in motion. Now get this, there are just as many of these free to move electrons in a copper penny as there are in copper wire. However, the electrons in a conductor don't do any work until they're set in motion. Voltage or electrical pressure makes the electrons in a conductor move to produce current flow and work. In an automobile, the battery, alternator, or generator supplies the necessary voltage. Now here's a point to remember. A battery or alternator doesn't create electricity any more than a water pump creates water. They simply produce voltage, which is the common name for electrical pressure. When current flows, the moving electrons collide with the atoms which make up the conductor material. These collisions account for the electrical resistance of a conductor. Resistance, in turn, causes heat. A conductor carrying a current is always heated slightly. Normally, this doesn't cause any trouble in an electrical circuit. High resistance, or too much current in a circuit, creates excessive heat and causes serious electrical trouble. One of the most common causes of electrical trouble is high resistance at terminals and connections. Don't forget that the path across a connection is just as much a part of the conductor circuit as the wire itself. While we're at it, let's clear up a few facts about circuits. Here's the simplest kind of circuit. Current flows from the battery through the lamp and returns to the battery. The lamp is the only resistance unit. Most automotive circuits aren't this simple because they have more than one resistance unit. Here we have a series circuit. The important thing to remember is that there is only one continuous path for current flow through the two lamps or resistance units. All of the current flowing in a series circuit must pass through each resistance unit. Why is this important? The current in amperes is always the same at all points in a series circuit. This is always true regardless of how many resistance units you connect in a series circuit. The total resistance in a series circuit is equal to the sum of all the resistances in the circuit. In other words, 
Simply add all of the resistances together to get the total resistance in a series circuit. As you'll see in a minute, the story is quite different in a parallel circuit. In this parallel circuit, the two lamps are connected so that there are two separate paths for current flow. The current divides, and part of it flows through lamp A, and part of it flows through lamp B. Current flow is not necessarily the same in all branches of a parallel circuit. The amount of current flowing in each branch of the circuit depends on the amount of resistance in that branch. In the circuit illustrated here, for instance, the resistance of the two lamps is not the same. More current flows through the low resistance of lamp A, and less current flows through the high resistance of lamp B. But how about current flow in the rest of the circuit? The total current flow in the, the, total current flow in the circuit is always equal to the sum of the current flow in the parallel branches. This is pretty basic, but it illustrates one reason why in circuit diagnosis, it's important to understand the difference between parallel and series circuits. I'm sure all of you know how to use an ammeter. You better not be too sure. Just last week, I met a fellow who was wishing he had read the book before he hooked up the ammeter. And besides, current readings are mighty valuable in locating some electrical troubles. I think you ought to review the highlights at least. I thought you were going to stop talking and listen, Tech but I'll have to admit you're probably right. Since the ammeter must measure all of the current flowing in a circuit, the ammeter has very low resistance and is very delicate. Remember this when you're using an ammeter. The circuit resistance must be high enough to limit current flow to an amount less than the maximum capacity of the ammeter. In other words, the circuit resistance must protect the ammeter against an overload. Never connect an ammeter across a circuit so that full battery voltage pushes excessive current through the meter. If you do, the meter may go up in a puff of smoke. Does that satisfy you, Tech? Yep. I'll keep quiet so you can get on to voltage and voltmeters. Unlike the low resistance ammeter, the voltmeter has high internal resistance. That's why it's not used or connected like an ammeter. To find the voltage available at any terminal in a circuit, connect the voltmeter from the terminal to ground. Here, the available voltage at the battery is 12 volts. But how about voltage at the switch and the lamp terminals? Voltage is always used up in overcoming the resistance in a circuit. Voltage is not exactly the same at any two points in the circuit because a voltage drop always occurs when current is moved through a resistance. Voltage drop is the difference between the voltage available at one point in the circuit and the voltage available at another point in the same circuit. A direct voltage drop reading can be made by connecting one voltmeter lead to the battery terminal and the other lead to the lamp terminal. When a voltmeter is connected across a circuit, it registers voltage drop not voltage available. Up till now, we've been skating around the fringes of Ohm's law without calling it by name. Since this is the most fundamental equation in all electrical science, we better review it briefly before we get into magnetism. Ohm's law simply tells you that one volt will move one ampere of current through a resistance of one ohm. But let's be practical. Automotive service manuals seldom give you resistance values in ohms. Instead, they give you voltage, voltage drop, or amperage specifications. Here's why. The engineer who designed the circuit knew the resistance of the units. He used Ohm's law to calculate the voltage needed, the maximum allowable voltage drop, and in some cases, the normal current flow in amperes. That's why all you need is an ammeter, a voltmeter, and a set of voltage and current specifications to find out whether or not circuit resistance and performance is normal. Any questions before we tackle magnetism? Just one. What would you do if I wasn't here to tell someone to turn this record? In an automobile, 
the cigarette lighter and the lights are the only electrical systems that operate without magnetism. If it weren't for magnetism and electricity, we wouldn't have present-day charging, cranking, and ignition systems. Let's see how magnetism and electricity team up to make modern automotive electrical systems possible. In order to understand magnetism, you must visualize what you can't see. Lines of magnetic force leaving at the North Pole and re-entering at the South Pole. These lines form the all-important magnetic field. If a bar magnet is bent into the shape of a horseshoe, the lines of force are concentrated. That's because the poles are closer together. The air gap is reduced and the field is stronger. Now let's look at another type of magnetic field. Current flow through a conductor creates circular magnetic lines of force around the conductor. The magnetic field formed along the entire length of the conductor has no north or south pole, no polarity. A weak electromagnet having a north and south pole is created by forming a current carrying conductor into a loop. That's because the lines of force created by current flow all pass through the center of the loop. If many turns of wire are wound around an iron core, we have a practical electromagnet. Increasing the number of turns of wire increases the lines of magnetic force. The iron core concentrates these lines of force to provide a much stronger field. We know that current flow through a conductor creates a magnetic field. This action can be reversed by using a magnetic field to generate a voltage and create current flow in a conductor. Let's see how this works. If a permanent magnet is rotated inside a loop of wire, the magnetic lines of force will cut across the conductor. The moving lines of force cause the free electrons in the conductor to start moving. This is electromagnetic induction. Notice the direction of current flow when the North Pole is at the top, the South Pole is at the bottom, and the magnet is turning in a clockwise direction. Now let's see what happens when the magnet is rotated one half of a revolution. Here, the direction of current flow through the conductor is reversed. That's because the South Pole is now at the top and the North Pole is at the bottom. The direction of current flow reverses every half revolution. That's why this type of generator is called an alternator. The output of an alternator, having a permanent magnet, depends on the speed of the rotating magnet. In an automobile, it isn't practical to try and control output by controlling speed. A practical way to control output is to control the field's strength. The strength of an electromagnet can be controlled by controlling current flow through the windings. In an alternator, the rotor core is wound with wire to form an electromagnet. The rotor windings are connected to an external source of direct current, the battery, through two slip rings and brushes. A voltage regulator is used to control current flow through the rotor windings. This, of course, controls field strength and output voltage. Some of you are probably wondering why we don't need another regulator to control maximum alternator current output. This is a good question, and it deserves an answer. The Chrysler-built alternator controls its own current output by inductive reactance. Now, that's a mouthful, but don't let it throw you. I'll explain it in easy steps. You already know that current flowing in a wire creates concentric lines of force around the wire. Actually, each circular line of force builds up and gets bigger and stronger as current flow through the conductor increases. Now, if two wires are side by side and current is flowing in one wire, the lines of force from this wire will spread out and cut across the second wire. What happens when lines of force cut across a wire? The lines of force cutting across the second wire induce a voltage and small current flow in the second wire. But notice, the currents in the two wires are going in opposite directions. Now, in an alternator stator, 
alternating current is flowing in all windings. Lines of force spread out from each wire and cut across the adjacent wire. This induces a voltage which opposes the original voltage and current flow. This is commonly called inductive reactance. When alternator speed is increased, the output current tries to increase. But since it is alternating current, it changes direction more often and produces more inductive reactance. That's how an alternator controls its own maximum current output. I don't know about the rest of you, but I think that was a pretty good explanation of inductive reactants. Just to make sure I got it straight, I'm going to check the reference book. Thanks, Tech, for giving me a chance to catch my breath before I tackle rectifiers. It would take a lot of explaining to tell you exactly how the six rectifiers in a Chrysler-built alternator change alternating current to direct current. But I think you should at least know what a rectifier does. A rectifier allows current to flow in only one direction. If a rectifier is connected into the output circuit of an alternating current generator, a current will flow through the rectifier for part of a revolution. When the output current from an alternating current generator tries to change direction, no current can flow through the rectifier. For all practical purposes, the circuit is disconnected when alternator current flow tries to reverse. Now let's see why reversing battery polarity will ruin a rectifier. A short circuit through the rectifier is created if battery connections are reversed. Excessively high current flow through the circuit will destroy the rectifier. This explains why battery polarity is so important. The electric motor probably did more to make automobiles popular than any other electrical device. The electric starting motor sure put women in the driver's seat. Let's take time to see how a direct current electric motor works. Here we see a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. Notice that on one side of the conductor, the concentric lines of force increase the field strength. On the other side of the conductor, the field is weakened. This unbalanced field condition pushes the conductor. It moves away from the strong field and toward the weak field. This basic electromagnetic principle is used to change electrical energy to mechanical energy. But what about rotation? To get rotating motion, the conductor is formed into a loop. Current flow through the loop causes an unbalanced field condition at both poles. Now the unbalanced field condition rotates the entire loop. By adding another loop, two brushes, and four contact segments, we have a simple armature and commutator. This automatically switches current from one loop to the other every quarter revolution to provide continuous rotation. Of course, a starting motor has more armature loops, more commutator segments, and electromagnets are used in place of permanent magnets. However, the basic principle remains the same. Before the class bell rings, I want to touch on the ignition coil. Earlier, we explained that voltage can be induced in a conductor by moving lines of force without any mechanical movement. This is the basic principle used in an ignition coil. Of course, there's a bit more to it than that. For example, an ignition coil has a primary winding with relatively few turns of wire and a secondary winding with many more turns. Current flow through the primary windings produces a strong magnetic field around both the primary and the secondary windings. If current through the primary windings is suddenly stopped, the magnetic field will collapse. Lines of force will cut across both the primary and the secondary windings. A voltage is induced in both windings by the collapsing or moving lines of force. Since there are thousands of turns of fine wire in the secondary winding, the induced voltage is very high, high enough to jump a spark plug gap. Since there are far fewer turns in the primary winding, the voltage induced is relatively low. Although the voltage induced in the primary windings is relatively low, it may reach 
several hundred volts. This voltage is great enough to arc across ignition points and burn them. That's why an ignition condenser is needed. The condenser absorbs the current flow from the primary windings until the ignition points are opened far enough to prevent arcing. In other words, by the time the condenser is fully charged, the air gap between the points is great enough to eliminate arcing. In addition to preventing arcing, the condenser stops current flow in the primary windings very abruptly. This in turn speeds up the collapse of the magnetic field, increasing the speed at which the lines of force cut the secondary windings. Increasing the speed of the collapsing magnetic lines increases the voltage induced in the secondary. You can see how important condenser action is to maximum ignition voltage and point life. Now, to wind up, that rings the bell on this session. I suggest you all use the reference book to bone up on the fundamentals we've covered today. That way, you'll be prepared for next month's session on electrical diagnosis. <laughs>